window, open it, and stick your head out and yell, I'm as mad as hell, and I'm not going to take this anymore! This is the Tearing Down Idols podcast, where we strike at the root of America's problems. And happy September, everyone. Welcome to episode 17 of the Tearing Down Idols podcast. I'm Paul, and I'm happy to be hanging out with you here for the next little while. I've had some computer issues, which, of course, prevented me from putting out fresh material as quickly as I would have liked. I would have had this out a couple of days ago if things had not gone the way they'd gone. But we're back in business, and hopefully... We're better than ever. I had to get a few upgrades, 4K upgrades, you know, so new graphics cards, things like that. But I'm working on getting to the point where I can do actual honest to goodness videos, which I hope to start putting out there in the near future. They'll be a little bit more sermon esque, not quite as chatty and informal like the podcast is. But they will be in glorious high definition. And because I'm not nearly as seasoned with video as I am with audio, bear with me. But it should be fun. At least for me, it should be fun. I can't make any promises about your end of things. Anyway, it is the most wonderful time of the year. It's full of cheer and joy and goodwill toward our fellow man. And of course, I'm talking about election season. I was driving through a town near me, and uh, I spotted an interesting billboard. It was this big blue thing, huge white block letters. It said, Democrats defend family, community, faith, and personal choice, or something along those lines. It might not be the exact wording, but the funny part about it is they defend all those things, but only so long as it's not a nuclear family with the father at the head. They defend community as long as it's not founded on Christian law. And they'll defend faith as long as it's not biblical faith. They'll defend personal choice, but only as long as that choice doesn't have anything to do with the choice to live in accordance with God's commands. They're opposed to anything like that. But anyway, I was looking at the sign and thinking about this, and I thought about how it really could very well have been a red sign that said Republicans defended all those things, and it still would have been just as ironic. The Republican Party has just been less blatant about being contrary to Christian values as the Democrats. They're both contrary to Christian values. They just have different MOs. Both those parties, being wings attached to the same stinking bird, They like to pretend to defend freedom and uphold the values of liberty and independence. They're spouting those words and those catchphrases all the time. But I started wondering. They promote liberty and independence and use those as the basis for everything that they do and promote. But liberty and independence from what? Exactly. I mean, you see all these rah-rah, God bless the USA Americans running around with their flags and their freedom isn't free bumper stickers. But could any of them tell you what exactly they're free from? If you were to walk up to them and ask, okay, so we're free, but what are we free from? I honestly doubt that the majority of these fist-pumping patriots could give you an answer to that question. All they know is they're proud to be Americans because at least they know they're free. And they'll gladly help you get a one-way plane ticket to North Korea if you disagree with them on that point. I suppose some of them might say it means they're free from the rule of England. Uh, Some might say it means they're free from Sharia law because thanks to our boys and girls in uniform, ISIS is now was-was. 
And there might even be a handful who'd go so far as to say it means we're free from tyranny, but then in the next breath they'll whine and complain about the rising taxes and intensifying police state and the growing influence of queers and commies and government and etc, etc, etc. So they don't really believe what they're saying in that case. I mean, let's face it, unless you're suffering from some form of mental retardation, you can't say we're free from tyranny in America. That's just stupid. Conservatives have been complaining about their boogeyman, the deep state, and all those gosh darn Democrats and rhinos. So they know there's a tyranny problem to some extent. They can't really honestly say that, oh, we're free from tyranny. Freedom and liberty and independence and words like that have become very nebulous terms because I don't think people really understand what those things are. Our definitions have changed a lot over the years, kind of like how somehow lunch and McDonald's have become synonymous with each other. Anyway, I know when some people, such as libertarians, for example, speak of independence in a societal and personal context, they basically intend it to mean something along the lines of the state of being free from reliance upon or imposition by any external authoritative power. They see it as a kind of social autonomy that leaves a society or an individual free to do whatever they want. And that definition may be more literally accurate than the previous examples I just gave. And it might even sound more learned and sophisticated. And believe me, libertarians love sophisticated sounding stuff. I would say that definition is just as inaccurate and even downright mythological as the others, if not more so. See, nobody is really truly independent, not in the strictest sense of the word. We're all dependent on someone or something. If you just break it down to a basic economic context, this is one example. You have the consumer who's dependent on the producer, and the producer in turn is dependent on the consumer. It's it's a give and take thing. You can't have any kind of exchange of goods and services, no kind of economy, no expansion of wealth without other people. We're all dependent on whatever it is that keeps us functioning and alive. And when it comes to a more general sense, we're all either dependent on or subject to the King of Kings, Jesus Christ, or dependent on or subject to men. And here's where it gets interesting. You can be dependent on men and still be dependent on God, whether you like it or not, because he's still sovereign no matter what, whether you believe in him or not, whether you rebel against him or not. But if you're dependent on God, you can be independent of men. It's really a demonstration of sovereignty when you think about it. If you're dependent only on God, then you're answerable to only one master. But in the case of dependence on men, You're carrying a double burden of both man's heavy yoke and God's judgment on you for rejecting him. There is no option number three. There's no such thing as being independent of both God and man. So we can't be like so many of these atheistic libertarians out there and claim that kind of autonomy. There's no getting away from God. Jonah learned that. He'll make sure we're always subject to something. And we're always, and I mean always, subject to and dependent on God. We're often subjugated to men, yes, but we're never totally free from both. Jesus arrived in the very thick of human oppression from the Roman Empire and Pharisee oversight. And he showed up and he started saying things like, Come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. That was in Matthew 11. But notice he never offered total autonomy or independence. He offered a change in yokes. He offered a lighter yoke, but he didn't offer to remove all yokes forever for all time. We were never intended for that as human beings. His yoke is as close to literal liberty and autonomy as we're ever going to get. Plus, we were made for that yoke. 
We were designed for it, and so we're going to be happiest under it. That yoke is what leads to fulfillment and joy of a kind that we would never, ever, ever find under any human yoke. And we'd never even find it if we did somehow manage to obtain total autonomy. Man is incapable of guiding his own footsteps. So to rely on man, whether that's some external government or ourselves individually, it's just the blind leading the blind. It's just wandering in the dark, headed for the ditch. Christ's light yoke is really an incredible blessing. And independence from that yoke is a curse. It's a death sentence. We always destroy ourselves when we try to get out from under it. Just look at where we are today. Society is rapidly self-destructing, and it's self-destructing so fast, even people who don't really know what's going on are starting to get a little worried. We're tasting the fruits of independence, and they're nasty. But when you think about it, even then, the fact that things aren't much, much worse is the hand of God at work. We're dependent on him to survive even under those conditions. He's controlling it all, despite how we pretend he isn't there. We are all alive right now because of our involuntary and often unsuspecting dependence on the decree of a sovereign God. If we're Christians and we're thinking in a Christian way, we're not going to think of independence as meaning complete and utter autonomy. We know what a mess that is. We understand that we've been made and designed and intentionally built to fear God and keep his commandments. It says so in Ecclesiastes 12.13. The Christian definition of independence is freedom from rule designed by men and imposed by men. Freedom from the establishment and enforcement of government and law that hasn't been sanctioned by God. And by the way, to all you Romans 13ers out there, no, not all governments in existence carry his seal of approval. Just check out Hosea 8.4, just for starters on that one. But to the Christian, liberty and independence are the freedom to seek first the kingdom of heaven and the life of trusting that everything we need will be supplied by God. What's more, the Christian view of freedom and liberty and independence is totally different from that of the world. See, to the world, independence is the end all of existence. That's the ultimate goal of human life. But the Christian has a much, much, much bigger picture in mind. The man of the world has a self-centered view of independence, so his vision stops there. He's independent, so there's nothing more to achieve. He's arrived. But to the Christian, liberty and independence are a means to an end, not the end itself. It's a very valuable and powerful tool. The Christian's goal is the kingdom, the will of God done here on earth as it is in heaven. Independence is a means of bringing that about. That's the Christian yoke. There is work to be done, and independence is the way cleared for us to do it. It expands more as a product of that work. The Christian definition of independence is escape from the heavy yoke of bondage to man, escape from bondage to idolatrous human governments. It's happily taking on Christ's lighter yoke. So going back to that billboard I mentioned earlier, I think when we take all this into consideration, that billboard becomes a total farce no matter which party put it up, because man never defends faith or family or community or personal choice, because all those things are contrary to his own kingdoms. These secular political systems only want to add more weight to the yoke of their bondage, but they lure people under that yoke by dangling the carrot of the very things they're actively destroying. If people really wanted independence, they'd see through this sham and start looking elsewhere. And ultimately, that elsewhere is the kingdom of God. It's the king seated at the right hand of glory. Where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. And so if we want liberty, we will seek first his will here on earth as it is in heaven, not going after the political shenanigans and goofing off of politicians. No matter what the human 
governmental system is. It's only going to lead to enslavement, to tyrants, to idols, to vain lusts, ultimately to the misery and suffering inherent to all those things. We've had thousands of years to experiment with various kinds of human government. We've seen it demonstrated over and over and over again. When are we going to start figuring this thing out? Man was not made to serve man. We weren't made to serve any ideologies or governments that men cook up. We were specifically made to serve the true king, the true kingdom. And that's why his burden is so much lighter. We were made for it. When we try to operate any other context, it's like trying to run a gas engine on diesel. It's going to cause nothing but damage to the engine. It's only going to make a mess. Whenever we try to live for anything other than that for which we were designed, we're shouldering a burden we were never meant to carry. We're monumentally stupid to prefer that to the light burden that God offers. But this is what happens when we stick the kingdom of heaven up beyond the blue, when we believe it has no bearing here on earth below. It's what happens when we claim Christ is just king in our hearts and in the eternal Disneyland up yonder. That's the effect of dualism. And dualism is the child of Zoroastrianism, which was Babylonian religion, which is alive and well today. I've had preachers, preachers, rebuke me for advocating a theocracy, all while they were running off and casting their ballots for their favorite Babylonian reprobate in the religion of rule by man. They chose their theocracy. It just wasn't the one of the Bible. These guys were sellouts to Babylon And they're going to reap the fruits. They are reaping the fruits. So in the end, it isn't a question of whether we're dependent or independent. It's more about whom we're dependent on or from whom we're independent. And I think in light of all this, it becomes abundantly clear why so many freedom-loving Murricans have no clue about what freedom is or what they're independent from. They're rejecting real freedom, so they have to come up with all sorts of other lame definitions which are demonstrably and observably weak. The same guy who's wearing a Stars and Stripes wife beater and ranting about liberals and socialists at the same time has no problem going into debt up to his eyeballs for a new RV. He's got no problem spending his children's inheritance. He's got no problem with his church inviting rabbis to speak. He's got no problem with eminent domain or property seizures. He has no problem with having to buy permits to do what he wants on his own land. He's got no problem with property taxes. And that's all because he doesn't have the faintest idea of what he stands for. He doesn't have a kingdom vision. He's just a mindless slave to the boob tube, regurgitating whatever Glenn Beck or Tucker Carlson or Ben Shapiro happened to vomit today. The loudest and most obnoxious advocates for rights and freedoms are usually shackled right to the troughs of Babylon. And by the way, they shackled themselves voluntarily, and they swallowed the key. And woe betide anyone who tries to cut them loose. They'll drive you off with socialist and love it or leave it, you commie scumbag. If you don't know what freedom is, you can't fight for it. You can't stand up for it. You're going to get shoved around just like anyone else. Christ repeatedly offers liberty. But most so-called freedom-loving, church-going Americans are drowning in oppression while they gurgle about how happy they are they don't have to obey biblical law anymore because it would be so hard. We need to try to show people where the freedom and liberty really lie. Who really defends things like family and community. That's the gospel message. The good news about a different kingdom, a better kingdom, a king who actually cares and doesn't make campaign promises he doesn't keep. Instead of being missionaries for our chosen Babylonian candidates, we need to be missionaries and ambassadors for Jesus Christ. People need to be pulled out of this quagmire of tyranny before they get pulled under completely and it's too late for them. Because forget about Donald Trump, Jesus Christ will drain the swamp. That swamp is Babylon, and all the swamp creatures, including the people who've been suckered into it, 
are going to go out right along with it. It's inevitable. It's promised. And praise God for it. Okay, I'll bow out here. Thanks again for joining me. If you have any comments or questions, feel free to email me at tdi at mail.com. Check out my website, tearingdownidols.com. Let's get the message of the kingdom out there, people. Folks need hope. They need purpose. They need a reason to exist beyond the stupid and empty promises of men. And they're starting to see how empty and stupid those promises are because a lot more people are starting to fall into despair. We can bring them hope. We can bring them that purpose. But we have to do the work to do it. That's our job as ambassadors. Anyway, I'll catch you on the next episode. And in the meantime, pray hard, stay strong, and keep yourself under Christ and above the world. This has been the Tearing Down Idols podcast, where we strike at the root of America's problems. Subscribe and visit tearingdownidols.com for more information. You can email the podcast at tdi at mail.com. <laughs>